Grüß Sie from Vienna, Austria. Welcome to Classical Cake, the podcast where we discuss topics relating to Viennese classical music while enjoying one of Vienna's delicious cakes. I'm your host, Daniel Adam Maltz. Today we will solve the mystery behind one of classical music history's most famous love stories, the identity of Beethoven's immortal beloved. My guest is Dr. Rita Stablin, a musicologist whose archival work combines music history, iconography, and genealogical research. Dr. Stablin, thank you for joining me. It's a pleasure to be here. Today's cake is a Choco Mousse Herz, or Chocolate Mousse Heart. This treat has a thin base of chocolate sponge cake and a chocolate mousse filling. It is completely coated in dark chocolate and is decorated with gold leaf. All of this is cut, appropriately, in the shape of a heart. Let's dig in. The famously temperamental Beethoven never married. But between July 6th and 7th in 1812, Beethoven wrote a three-part letter. In it, he writes of his unconditional love and devotion to someone he refers to as his unsterbliche Geliebte, or immortal beloved. He never sent this letter. The letter was discovered after Beethoven's death and naturally sparked intense curiosity about what woman inspired such passion. Researchers have been divided as to whom the intended recipient was. Many times it's fostered a heated debate. Finding the answer required cross-referencing 200-year-old letters, diaries, memoirs, as well as other documents to find clues. It also required challenging previously accepted scholarship, approaching the subject from new angles to find the truth. But through dedication, Dr. Stablin finally solved this mystery. Dr. Stablin, why has the idea of Beethoven's immortal beloved captured imaginations for almost 200 years? Well, the letter itself is one of the most passionate letters that anyone has ever written, and certainly the most passionate by a composer. And because there's a mystery behind it, <laughs> people wanted to solve the mystery, and uh, each generation has had a go at it, and yeah. <laughs> people love a story, right? They want to feel like yeah. they're a part yeah. of it. What motivated your search for Beethoven's Immortal Beloved? When I was a piano teacher in Vancouver for seven years, um, I read the book by Marie Elizabeth Tellenbach on Josefina Brunswick as the Immortal Beloved. Mm. And that convinced me that she had the right woman. And I mean, I can't say that I was the first to come up with Josefina. In fact, it was an earlier woman who actually, in my mind, solved the mystery. And this was Lamara. She was in her 80s in 1920 when she brought out the book, but um, she was already in her 80s and died soon after, and so that's where it remained. Yeah. I mean, because her solution was never taken seriously. And, uh, yeah, I should go back and explain that this letter was found in Beethoven's estate, along with the Heiligenstadt yeah, Heiligen Testament. Heiligen. And it ended up in Schindler's possession. <laughs> How? I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. And Schindler brought out the first official biography of Beethoven in 1840. And there he claimed that the letter was... Um, mentioned Julie Guichardi. She was the dedicatee of the Moonlight Sonata. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until 1860 when he brought out another edition of his Beethoven biography with a facsimile of the letter that people could see, well, Julie isn't even mentioned in, the in Beethoven's yeah. letter. So it was just made up yeah. by Schindler. So as we mentioned, um, Josephine of Brunswick as the immortal beloved. What do we know about Josefina, and why would Beethoven have been so enraptured by her? Josefina came to Vienna in May of 1799 with her mother and her older sister, Teresa, to have piano lessons with Beethoven. Okay. And Teresa explains all of this in her memoirs in great detail, and how Beethoven was so taken with the musicality and, I guess, with the beauty of Josefina, that instead of just one hour a day, he would uh, teach them for four hours a day. And um, they also went on picnics and uh, outings and to 
um, forte piano workshops, and Beethoven recommended a Walter piano, and so on. And so he was with them for this whole time. But Josefina's mother was looking for a husband for her daughters, and the older one, Teresa, well, she sort of had a bit of a crooked back and wasn't that attractive. So Josefina was uh, very charming, very beautiful. And on one of their outings, they went to the wax museum of Count Dame, Josef Dame. And he later said that as soon as he saw Josefina, he said, she is going to be my wife. So this speaks to Josefina's uh, sort of magnetic... Yeah, idea. exactly. I think she, she had this attraction that the men just just mm -hmm. fell for her. It wasn't just her husband, Dame. And what I am bringing out now are the 108 marriage letters between Dame and Josefina. And they, they're they very erotic. And they <laughs> show, uh, yeah, I mean, that it was really a loving marriage, not uh, like what you read in Therese's uh, memoirs. Let's get to the evidence you discovered. You presented some interesting similarities between letters known to be written by Beethoven to Josefina and the immortal beloved letter. After the Second World War, the communists came into the Czech Republic and descendants of Josefina, of her son Fritz, they fled and they took with them 14 letters that they had in Beethoven's hand and these are love letters from Beethoven to Josefina that he wrote between about 1804 and, say, 189. Mm -hmm. This was the period after Dame had died. Josefina was a widow with four young children, and Beethoven gave concerts in her house. She was now running this museum and continued to give her le lessons. And so you have these letters that turned up and the language is very close to what uh, Beethoven used in the letter to the immortal beloved. Yeah. He calls her my angel, mm -hmm. my all. Yeah. And he talks about uh, his love for her and that he's won her heart and that it will uh, make him more productive in his mm -hmm. compositions. And... Um, that she knows he's faithful to her and no other woman can win his heart. Mm -hmm. And so you have the same sort of uh, wording in these earlier love letters and the letter to the immortal beloved where he says, you know I have been faithful to you, that right. no other woman can. Uh... So to clarify for those who don't speak German, Please explain the significance of Beethoven referring to Josefina as a du <laughs> instead of the formal z. Yeah, it's like the French too. <laughs> <laughs> um, Beethoven very rarely used du. And to use du with a woman... Especially was, with many women, I imagine. Yes, it would, would have meant that there had been an intimate uh, love relationship. So, um, so as you mentioned, you have, uh, Dame had died in 1804, and so Beethoven now is writing letters to the widowed Josephina right. from Brunswick. So, and when did Josephina marry Stackelberg? <laughs> what you get in these uh, 14 love letters, and there are also um, drafts of her replies, um, you see that towards the end, around 1807, Josephina didn't allow Beethoven into her house anymore. Yeah. And I had found a letter from Charlotte, the youngest sister who had just gotten married, and this is um, in 1807, where she's warning uh, Josefina, don't uh, be alone with Beethoven. Um, don't let him into your house. Um, let God return peace to your soul and, and so that you can return to your children and your family. Which is, of course, very similar to the Samora Beloved letter in the way that Beethoven says you're hiding yourself. Exactly, he says, and don't hide yourself from me. So um, what other woman <laughs> meets <laughs> right. that? I mean, Thanks. and so you have this case where she did not allow him into her house and hid herself from him. Mm. So... Um, 
In 1808, Josefina, Teresa, and the two little boys, Fritz and Carl, went on a long journey and ended up in Switzerland. And it was there that they met Stackelberg, who was an Estonian baron. And I discovered that Josefina got pregnant mm -hmm. and her fifth child was illegitimate, Maria Laura. And so she was, in a sense, forced to marry this baron. And so the marriage took place in Gran, Estergom, Hungary, in February of 1810. I just recently discovered another letter by Teresa to Josefina with the proof that they were hiding Maria Laura mm -hmm. for about three years. And I also um, found another letter um, from Teresa to Josefina, this is much later, where she's recommending that they go for a, a holiday together. And she says, we could go to Naples, we could go to Brazil, or we could go to England with Beethoven. And this is dated 1818. Oh, wow. And all the people, all these scholars in the States and in England and Germany who claim that Josefina cannot be the immortal beloved, they're all saying, there's no proof that there was any contact between Josefina and Beethoven later on. Well, here you <laughs> have 1818. So. Let's move forward. It's, it's believed that Beethoven had a surprise encounter with his immortal beloved in Prague on July 3rd, 1812, just three days before the immortal beloved letter is written. What is the evidence that this encounter took place, and what clues placed Josefina in Prague at this time? We know from Therese Brunswick's memoirs that there was a serious... Uh, fight uh, between Josefina and her second husband, Stuckelberg, in June of 1812. And that Stuckelberg got really angry and, yeah, left. And so Josefina was left alone, and there were great financial problems. And uh, we know, in fact, I found documents in Brno that Stuckelberg had made a quick trip to Prague in 1811 to borrow money from a banker there. And this money was now due, and, well, Stuckelberg had left Josefina, and so she had a wagon with horses, she had uh, many relatives from her first husband in Prague. And after Dame's death, she took all her four children to speak with the Emperor Franz. And he said, don't worry, your children are my children. Well, the Emperor was in Prague on July 1st. And so I think that she wanted to try to solve this financial problems by speaking with the emperor and speaking with relatives of her husband. And then working on her papers in Yinji Hufradis, I found some diaries, um, not really chronological, but some of the entries are June 1812. And one of the entries says, I want to speak to Liebert in Prague. And we also know from her sister Teresa's memoirs that Josefina had made a plan for 1812. Teresa was supposed to take care of the older children in this a villa in the suburbs of Vienna, and Josefina wanted to go again to Karlsbad. And so Teresa certainly spent the summer of uh, 1812 taking care of the children in a villa in Hucking and. Uh, and so where was Josefina? Um, and we know that Beethoven met unexpectedly someone in Prague, because in a letter later to Farnhagen, von Enze, he apologizes for not having kept um, an appointment that he had made on the evening of July the 3rd. And so when the letter to the Immortal Beloved dated it, uh, July 6th, and he, it, it only mentions the trip between Prague and Teplitz, where Beethoven was writing this letter. So, in other words, he must have met this woman in Prague, Prague. on the 3rd, because that's when he didn't keep his appointment. So, up to this point, we've discussed Beethoven longing after Josefina for years, a surprise encounter where they spent the night together in Prague, 
and the immortal beloved letter that Beethoven never sent, where he pleaded for Josephina to find a way for them to be together. Then there comes an entry in Beethoven's diary that ends, Auf diese Art mit A geht alles zu Grunde. This means, in this manner with the initial A, everything goes to ruin. Besides clearly stating that there was not a happy ending to this affair, many researchers also said that if the immortal beloved were Josephina, that the diary entry would have to read, in this manner with J, everything goes to ruin. In fact, there's been a lot of confusion surrounding this initial A. Beethoven wrote this entry in a diary that he started in the fall of 1812. It's actually the first entry. And um, because of this letter that looked like A in the first copy, because Beethoven's diary is actually missing, and we only have two copies. And uh, a lot of scholars in the 20th century claimed that this letter A referred to the immortal beloved. And so they were looking for a woman whose first name started with A. So that's where you get Antony Brentano, or Almarie Esterhazy, or Amalia Sebald, and so on. And I like to look at old problems from a new angle. And so I thought, well, auf diese Art mit A geht alles zu Grunde. Why should the letter A refer to the woman? The problem person would be her husband. He's the one that's causing all the problems for Beethoven. And because I did so much work on papers in the archives, especially Yinji Kufradets, where you have all the papers that were sent to Josefina, I noticed that her husband, Stockelberg, always referred to with just ST, that the ST, I, I used to misread it as an A, and then that gave me the idea, hey, this might not be A, this might have been a mistake by the copyist, and it really was of these art mit Stackelberg, everything is going to ruin. And so you, in doing your, your research into this theory, found examples in Beethoven's hand where he writes both an A and an ST in Beethoven's hand, so that we have definitive proof. And you found something curious about his ST, his ST looks very much like an A. And um, Greffer, who was the copyist, if he just saw this one cipher. initial cipher, well, because ST is kind of unusual, right. and A is much more common, so he just uh, copied it as an A, but I think it really was ST. It sends people down the wrong track yeah. for hundreds of years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, we're, if we're skipping forward now, there is another cryptic comment that has stumped Beethoven researchers for years. It comes from Fanny Giantasio del Rio in September of 1816, when she wrote down a snippet of a conversation she overheard between Beethoven and her father on a walk in Baden. What is your view about this? Yes, I mean, uh, her comment was that she overheard Beethoven's, uh, well, her father had asked Beethoven, had he never met a woman? that he would want to marry. And Beethoven had said yes, five years ago, mm -hmm. he had gotten to know, he used the word kennen, yeah. um, gotten to know a woman. Well, we know that Beethoven knew Josephina since 1799, so five years before uh, would disqualify her. But I decided to look at the problem again from a new angle and to look at that word kennen and thought, okay, if you view it in the biblical sense of <laughs> to, yeah, say, to, know. To, to know a woman, sleep with her, yeah, then it fits Josefina. Um, and so your theory, you're, you're saying that Fanny Giantasio del Rio is simply substituting the other German verb, kennen lernen, which is just to get to know somebody. Well, she does admit that she was at some distance mm -hmm. and was trying to listen in <laughs> onto this conversation. And... She found on Beethoven's desk something that said, um, my heart overflows at the sight of beautiful nature, although without her. In other words, he must have been walking in nature in Baden with his beloved earlier. 
It would seem to suggest that four years later it was still and has only ever been this one woman. You presented evidence that places Josephina and Baden around this time as well. Yes. First of all, there are the memoirs of her oldest son, Fritz, who he started writing when he was 20 years old to his 15-year-old bride. Um, and he talks about how they had a wonderful summer, 1816, in Baden. And uh, Maria Elizabeth Hellenbach had already found in the um, spa lists Josefina's entry later that summer. But knowing Fritz had said uh, end of April that they'd already gone to Baden, there I found in an earlier list, uh, Josefina, I should say, had been hiding mm -hmm. under a assumed name, Myersfeld. <laughs> but it was uh, hyphenated, Dame Myersfeld, there it was. I mean. And yeah, now we have proof that Josefina was in Baden mm. for weeks. Right. So this is where the story gets particularly interesting to me, and I think to anybody who has an interest in this subject, is that there is more to this encounter on July 3rd in Prague in 1812 that Beethoven had with Josefina. In fact, you give evidence that Josefina gave birth to Beethoven's child. So why, given this, would she have returned to her husband? <laughs> well, I mean, what a scandal. I mean, she, I know that in 1811, a year before the immortal beloved letter, she uh, was not sleeping with her husband anymore because um, there are letters where she instructed the setup of their bedrooms when she was going to go to that estate in Moravia that they'd bought. And she even wanted a maid sleeping between the two bedrooms. So all of a sudden, <laughs> after this night with Beethoven, she probably suspects, oh, oh what uh, do I do if I am pregnant? Because she was so fertile. All of her other earlier six children were conceived immediately after yeah, she'd slept with <laughs> her first husband and then her second husband. And so I think what happened is that instead of going on to Karlsbad, as she had originally planned, and that's why in Beethoven's letter you have that statement, we will probably see each other in K. Yeah. But no, I think that she then sent him a letter saying, oh, I have to change my plans, I'm going back to Vienna. And so that's why he never sent the letter. And uh, so what did she have to do but try to fix her marriage? And uh, yeah, and I think from the memoirs of her son Fritz, you see what efforts she went to, to be the loving wife. She even uh, applied for a pass to go to Italy with him and the children and so on. And yeah, and then exactly nine months after the letter to the immortal beloved, you have her seventh child born, Minona. <laughs> and this would explain how in the fall, Beethoven returning to Vienna sees a happily married Josefina with Stockelberg and writes, Auf diese Grund mit ST geht alles zu Gründe. That's right. And there are some other um, passages in his diary where uh, around the birth of um, Minona, where he says, Oh, I, I will have to leave Vienna. Why? I mean, yeah. maybe he thought there'd be this scandal about the paternity. Or he wanted to um, undertake a gross handlung, something, and I think that was to declare his paternity. But instead, he didn't want to cause a scandal for mm -hmm. Josefina. And so it's exactly at that point that he lays claim to his nephew Carl, even though Carl's father was still alive and wouldn't die for another few years. But because Beethoven couldn't lay claim to his own child, he then took over this nephew and so there were deep psychological reasons for him doing that. Yeah. What do we know about Minona? Yes, well, the name comes from Ossian, that uh, Gaelic bard who <laughs> and appears in Goethe's Sorrows of Werther and is the daughter of a musician. And the names that Josefina gave to her children all have symbolic meaning. And I think this is wow. named Minona as the daughter of a musician is of significance. And um, Teresa, in her memoirs, talks about Minona as uh, being different from the other children, being very star strong in her personality, so much that we called her the governess. Mm -hmm. And she also showed the most genius among the children. 
And what I'm doing right now is to search further in the papers of the Brunswick family for letters that Minona herself wrote or um, comments about her. And what I have found is that there, she was musical and yeah. that they were hoping that she could make a living as a musician. Right, and there's this snippet from the conversation book, was it 1819 or 1820, I believe, uh, where, where somebody writes to Beethoven about this musical child. Um, this was about the time when Stackelberg brought his three daughters, including this Minona, back to Vienna. And uh, Teresa says Minona was six years old, so this was late 1819. And exactly at that point in Beethoven's conversation book, someone is asking him and writing out, you talk so much about the woman that her husband is going to suspect that the child among his children that has musical talent is your child. <laughs> I mean, this is great uh, yeah, really. proof. You mentioned in one of your articles that Minona is buried in Vienna's Central Cemetery. Beethoven is buried there as well, of course. What are your thoughts about the DNA test? <laughs> uh, years ago, a Berlin film crew wanted to, to make a film with me holding a shovel at her grave. <laughs> and uh, I had heard that the grave site was up for sale. And of course, what would happen to the bones? It'd be gone forever. So I contacted the health agency, the Gesundheitsamt, and they're responsible for grave sites. And um, found out what I could. And just recently, the business manager of the Beethoven house in Bonn, Malte Bürker, wanted to have all of my correspondence with this Gesundheitsamt. Oh, yeah, because in the end, it was sort of like, well, who's going to pay for this? And, I mean, I can't afford to pay to have her bones, her remains exhumed. And then they said, pietatlos, there's no piety, because you'd have to exhume Beethoven as well to make a, a study. And then other people told me it's not possible to determine fatherhood from such old bones. But Malte Böcker, the uh, business head at the Beethoven House in Bonn, um, wrote me just recently an email saying, I will... I'd like to let you know that I have secured Minona's grave site and nothing will happen to her bones. And what I've been doing recently is watching all these YouTube um, stories, where do I come from in these DNA studies? Well, if 50% of Minona's bones come from Estonia, well, then Stuckelberg is the father. But if 50% come from Bonn, well then that, that would prove it. So who knows? I mean, DNA studies are improving. As I say, you can't, at this point, determine fatherhood, but maybe there are other ways. Yeah. We'll have to see. Dr. Stablin, I would like to thank you personally for your research. Beethoven is the reason why I fell in love with music, and your research sheds light on a side of Beethoven that is quite opposite to the fiery personality we often think of a Beethoven who wanted to love and be loved. So thank you for joining me today. It was a pleasure. And thanks to you listeners for tuning in. If you haven't already, please subscribe to Classical Cake. Visit classicalcake.com for more episodes and exclusive content relating to Viennese classical music and culture. I'm Daniel Adam Maltz. See you in Vienna. Auf Wiedersehen.